Hello, and welcome to River Horse. We have a special treat for you today. We are interviewing the author of the Labyrinth uh, adventure game. So um, it was brought together by a lot of people, but the, uh, the main bulk of the scenes, I think 90 out of 100 of the scenes, were written by our interviewee today, um, Ben Milton. Hello, Ben. Hello. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, we contacted you many moons ago now, and uh, since then we've been working together to create uh, the Labyrinth RPG. I've actually also got uh, the prototype here, which um, you've not seen in person yet, but um, this is just a sort of uh, a quick prototype just to see if everything is actually possible. And it is the uh, beautiful dice in the, uh, in the box. I say beautiful, those are actually just stand-ins, but we're pretty certain we can make dice. But, uh, and then a sort of standard, well, not, uh, not standard, but uh, sort of a print preview of uh, a few of the pages uh, and they're mostly blank. Hopefully the uh, final book will not be 90% blank. But, uh, but we're not talking about that today. I'm sure you can find videos on us talking about that elsewhere on the internet. Uh, probably at riverhorsegames.com. Another thing you can find elsewhere on the internet is the other half of this interview. So uh, Ben has a chat with uh, me and Chris, the uh, designers of the rules, and a lot of the graphic design layout and sort of management of the whole project. So to find that, pop over to Questing Beast. Uh, on YouTube, uh, which is Ben's site, and um, check it out. So without any further ado, let's dive into the actual interview. Um, my first question is one that we ask uh, most of the people that we, uh, we interview, and that's uh, how did you get into role-playing? What was your sort of, um, your start into the, into the hobby? Um, I actually got started playing role-playing um, doing Pathfinder, and this was about six years ago. Um, I was introduced to it by a teacher friend of mine. I just started teaching, and a friend of mine happened to be Andrew Armstrong, who runs Dawnforge Cast, which is one of these really big uh, YouTube channels. At least it is now. Um, it was pretty big at the time, too. And so he was starting a new campaign in Pathfinder, and he had new players. So we were already teaching together, so he invited me over, and I got started that way. So I got started in the more crunchy end of RPGs. And I had a lot of fun with that. We played Pathfinder for a long time. We switched over to 5th edition. Um, and then eventually I got more into indie and OSR games from there. So that was sort of my pathway in. Yeah, Pathfinder could probably be thought of as, as one of the harder sort of way, ways into the hobby. It's, it's almost the, <laughs> the peak of the sort of the rules crunchiness, like uh, yeah. getting more and more and more complicated until 5th uh, until edition did a lot of the sort of uh, cutting out of that sort of... Um, uh, that style of sort of design and bloat, although I'm sure it'll get there given a, given enough time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems to be heading in that direction, but they're doing a pretty good job keeping it under control. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, well, like, all, all things do. I'm sure when uh, yeah. when sixth edition comes out, everyone will be talking about how sleek it is compared to the uh, <laughs> <laughs> compared to fifth edition. So that's how you got into role playing games, playing them in general. Um, mm -hmm. How a lot of people sort of um, stopped there as a hobby. Um, you uh, got into both um, reviewing sort of uh, stuff that's out there and also creating your own stuff. So, sort of, at what point did that start? Was it uh, after a lot of playing, or was it sort of? Yeah. Immediate? So, I mean, the re the reviewing started pretty soon after I got into RPGs, mostly because again, Andrew already had a YouTube channel, so. The forefront of my mind was, oh, you can have a YouTube channel about Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> and that never occurred to me before. Um, so my I, my channel, Questing Bee, started out as a map making channel because I I was in a meeting and I was really bored and I was just um, or was it like at a conference of some sort? I can't remember exactly what. And I would just started drawing a map because I've been drawing maps ever since I was a kid. It's just been like a, a doodling thing that I do when I'm not doing anything else. Um, as a kid, I developed these huge maps with my friends. Uh, and I just started drawing this map, and uh, I uploaded it to Reddit, it, probably to the one of the map-making or RPG subreddits. And a lot of people really liked it. They said, this is really cool. How did you draw this? So I'm like, OK, I'll just make a video. And so I made a video of me uh, showing the technique of how I drew maps. And the channel kind of took off from there. So the, my channel has been kind of fueled by Reddit in a lot of ways um, from the beginning. 
and then from there I started making more and more map making videos but then at the same time I was collecting a lot of indie RPG books so I was getting all of these books that I really enjoyed I thought were really original and were really pushing the boundaries of what D&D like games uh, could be but there was no information about them anywhere especially on YouTube there was no reviews of them no one was talking about them the only way you could even learn they existed was by going into like deep into the blogosphere of like the old school the old school D blogosphere which not a lot of people knew about so i'm like okay this is a great opportunity to lots show of, off these these books yeah lots of white text on black backgrounds yeah <laughs> it, it, it's hard to know what, what to, where to go and what to look for because it's like there's all these little blogs and they know each other but no one knows about them yeah um, yeah it can often be sort yeah. of just stuff is almost thrown out there and then mm -hmm. sort of almost forgotten about and onto the next thing. Um, yeah, especially like six or seven years ago, it was like this very insular community um, that just everyone kind of talking to each other. So by making reviews of these books and putting them out on YouTube, I, I thought this would be a great way to give this whole weird little community that I really like way more exposure and so people will know this stuff existed. And then it kind of expanded from there as I made more and more reviews. And then people from who were making these books started contacting me and being like, can I send you books? You can put them on your channel. I'm like, sure, I'll <laughs> sure, take free, it. Free stuff. <laughs> I'm not gonna say no, yeah. So I've been doing that for a while now and I think it's been a, a big success. So you said you came in through, um, through cartography, through creating maps, which is, mm -hmm. I, guess, I guess I don't know. I think a lot of people almost go the other way. They, they start playing role playing games and then create a world for that sort of purpose yeah. um but it sounds like you've you've come in the other way um so these these maps these sort of world building projects with your with your friends could you tell us a little bit about that yeah so um it started out when i was i don't know 10 through 15 or so uh i was into writing novels because i was really into fantasy lord of the rings and things like that and most of my friends were too we were all just big fantasy nerds and so we were all trying to write novels set in our own fantasy world. And then eventually all these fantasy worlds just kind of merged into one just giant fantasy continent. <laughs> uh, we drew this gigantic map that was like four by three pieces of printer paper. Um, and then we, we developed a 6,000 year history for the whole thing. Um, and uh, at, so at the same time we were yeah doing a lot of map making, a lot of world building. Although role playing didn't really come into it we were all gaming nerds, so we played a lot of war games and card games and things like that. But we had no idea how role-playing games really worked. Like, I knew they existed, I knew the general idea, but I had no experience with someone actually running them. So I think we tried running an RPG of the Decipher Lord of the Rings game. Um, and that went through like one session and it just kind of fell apart because <laughs> so we had no idea how this was supposed to work. Um, so it wasn't until more recently that I got enough exposure with an actual group who knew what they were doing. They're like, oh, okay, I mm. get it now. And it's quite often um, helpful to have someone who sort of knows what they're doing, sort of bring it into the fold. Yeah, uh, exactly. Especially and, and I mean, oh, go sorry, go ahead. Uh, especially for sort of more complex games, like uh, as you were saying earlier, sort of Pathfinder can be really difficult if you're, if you're just yeah. picking that up um, yeah. from the get-go. And, and especially like, back in the day when I was doing this, there wasn't any YouTube. And like YouTube has completely changed mm. that because now if you're interested in RPGs, you can just like watch an actual play and then boom, like you get how this works. And there's so many advice videos and all of this stuff that it's way easier to get into RPGs without finding a group first. Um, I'm sure it's still a little bit more difficult, but you can definitely do it now in a way that would be really hard, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, I, I know a lot of people and I, I've done it as well who we're into RPGs without a group. <laughs> and right. so it's like, yeah. you're almost reading these things as a novel, like, oh, yeah, no, this would be a really interesting thing to, to get into. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so what would you say is your favorite role-playing system, if you were to choose one? And mm. let's say not one you've, uh, you've written for, <laughs> so not, <laughs> not the Labyrinth, which I'm, I'm sure would be your, your choice. I mean, most of the games I play are OSR games, so sort of based on old Dungeons and Dragons. But um, there's plenty of people who have done new takes on that. And I think one of my favorite ones is Into the Odd, uh, which is an extremely stripped down version of D&D, &D, where there's just like three stats uh, that you roll to make saves on. Uh, you don't make any to hit rolls. So if you attack someone, you just roll how much damage you do. Um, it's incredibly oh. light and straightforward. And so it focuses everything on getting to the decision-making and problem-solving aspects as quickly as possible. 
So if you get into combat, combat goes really fast. Everyone's just rolling damage at each other. So it takes like one or two rounds before you figure out, oh, this was a good idea getting into this combat, or this was a bad idea, I should <laughs> run away. So things move toward decision points really quickly. Um, and that was actually the basis of Maze Rats, which was the first game that I made, because I liked Into the Odds so much. But, um, so uh, speaking of Maze Rats, and sort of, uh, you mentioned OSR, which um, if you could maybe explain a little bit about what OSR right. is, I'm sure that's an acronym yeah. that uh, not everyone uh, understands, but also how that sort of scene maybe uh, influenced Lab the, the design of Labyrinth. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, OSR stands for Old School Renaissance. Um, the R can mean different things. People say Old School Revival, Old School whatever, rules. Um, so it's just a movement that started, you know, 10 or maybe even longer, 10, 15 years ago, with people, especially around 4th edition. 4th edition comes out, a lot of people don't like it. Some people go back to 3rd edition and looking at Pathfinder. Um, and uh, some people say, okay, let's go back even farther. Because we have all of these games, you know, all the way back to basic D&D or even the original D&D, like OD&D. &D. Um, and at the time, a lot of people didn't really understand why anyone would play those games. It's been, you know, 30 years. We've advanced the gaming technology. But a lot of people start talking about these rule sets and saying, wait a second, people played these games and enjoyed them. There must be a reason why people played them and enjoyed them. And so they started um, sort of delving into why the rules are written the way they were and... Uh, those those sorts of things and is talking to a lot of people who had been playing those games for 40 years without stopping so the whole community developed around these rules that were extremely fast and extremely simple and provided this sort of bare bones chassis that you could build um, all sorts of worlds and other rules on top of so now it's this whole community of people who are really into hacking the game making their own rule sets and while still being more or less cross compatible so if you w get into a lot of OSR books and blogs and so on, there's this huge explosion of creative world building and new rules hacks, but all of it's mostly cross compatible. So you can get all the stuff and just mash it together into your own thing, which I really, really love. Yeah, there's, um, but, there's yeah. quite a lot of sort of system agnostic stuff in there, isn't there? Sort of just, yes. here's, here's the adventure. You guys know the stats. You guys know how to, how to work things out in whatever system you're using. Um, yeah. And... The Labyrinth does a little bit of that as well. In um, the adventure is definitely sort of um, done in a far enough sort of back from the rules that you can mm -hmm. you can separate the two and use uh, whatever you like. But, um, yeah, that's something that I really pushed for while I was writing Labyrinth. Is I tried to make it as much about decision making as possible. Obviously, there's there's roles in there. You can you can roll dice to help you do one thing or another. Um, but each scene is its own weird little problem to solve. And so it's easy to adapt that into other systems because it's the problem that's the interesting part, not the stats. So that's a big OSR thing where it's all about decision making and making the players at the table think carefully about what they're going to do rather than looking to their character sheet to solve the problems, they have to solve the problem. Um, so yeah, I really focused on that in Labyrinth, um, making it as much about players feeling immersed in the world, like they are in the labyrinth and they're being confronted with these problems and they need to find a way to deal with it. But, um, so um, in the labyrinth, there are, there's a lot of scenes and um, you use, so one of the ideas of the labyrinth is that it's sort of quite replayable. Uh, that was one of the things we, uh, we mm -hmm. asked uh, for you to be able to provide is that the same group might play the same scene um, more than once. They might fail and play again. Uh, and of course, the labyrinth turns people around, so you end up at the same sort of place more and more times. Um, Utilise a lot of uh, tables to to create that experience. Sort of, uh, how do you go about filling out a table? There's lots of there's lots of them in the book. Uh, so these <laughs> yeah, random so tables. Basically, every scene has um, at least one random table that alters some fundamental aspect of the scene. So that's what I focused on. As I looked at the scene, I looked at the problem, and I thought. What are some core features of this scene that if they were swapped out with other things would alter the problem solving aspect of it, um, even if it was just a little bit? So I, I avoided focusing on random tables that just changed aesthetic elements or like minor details. I wanted things that would actually change the problem that you had to solve, because that's what gives replayability, hmm. right? If like the guy you encounter is a different color the second time around, it's like, who cares? It's the same scene. But if he's, if he's a different kind of character, if he has a different motivation, or if um, like the activities going on in the scene are different, 
then now you have to think about it differently. So that's what I was focusing on as much as possible. So the sort of changing the mechanics of the scene and sort of what the solution could be, right. rather than yeah. uh, rather than just aesthetics. Yeah. But, um, so uh, in your daily work, uh, in your in your day job, uh, you are a teacher. Um, has this influenced your writing? Yeah, absolutely. Well, my first game, Maze Rats, and my second one, Nave, are both designed primarily for the kids that I teach. So they're all fifth graders, so 10, 11 years old. And um, I, I have a club after school where I run role-playing games for them. And there wasn't a really good one that I could use. I tried a couple of them, and they worked OK. But I'm like, why don't I just write a game that is my ideal game to run for kids? It's like, how hard can it be? So I spent like a year writing um, Maze Rats, which basically did that. Um, and it's given me a lot of insight into making games that are mechanically simple and straightforward, but have a lot of richness in terms of the decisions that you can make and the choices that you can make and challenging the player's imagination and their creativity. Because that's what I really wanted to focus on because I'm a math teacher, so I like problem solving. And I wanted to put that sort of thing into the, the games that I was running. Not necessarily puzzles, but just problems in general, right? Social problems, um, just like geography problems, things like that. Um, yeah, and that definitely came into play in the Labyrinth, for sure. Um, so, when designing the Labyrinth, or the Labyrinth adventure game even, uh, what challenges are there? Sort of, How did you approach the, um, the problem of uh, turning a movie into a game? Yeah, so when I started, I uh, watched Labyrinth a bunch of times, and I just like took notes the whole time. And it was really nice to find out that the movie is kind of like a role-playing game already. So that was really helpful. There are so all the scenes in the movie are like little, you know, um, isolated problems that she has to that Sarah has to deal with and get past in order to proceed. And so I just took as many notes as possible about all the different weird creatures, possible environmental hazards, um, traps, just weird situations, background um, scenery that could be repurposed for different things. And I just had this giant page of notes. And then I just started rating that for ideas and then combining them with each other. I have a lot of random tables that I've created previously for games like Maze Rats. So I looked at all of those things that I had generated before, started combining them with stuff from Labyrinth, and it started kind of coming together pretty quickly. Um, yeah, it's not, it was not a hard movie to turn into a role-playing game because it's, it already is a dungeon crawl almost. Mm. So it worked really well. But, um, something I really like about the, um, about the book is how essentially if you rolled correctly on on all the tables and you sort of met the scenes in a particular order mm. you could get pretty close to the actual sort of events of the movie um there's all of the stuff that happens in the movie but there's also twists on it there's also sort of changes on things and how you've also taken some of the um uh some of the tropes uh, or things in the background, even um, in the mm -hmm. movie, and and made them into things you can interact with, and sort of, I think you've worked with with a little bit of deleted scenes, and mm -hmm. um, there's the obelisk with all the the arms pointing in different directions, which in the movie yeah. Sarah just walks past, and goes, oh that's strange, but um, but then in the game is actually an object that you can you can use to solve problems, and it has some mm -hmm. uh, special special effects to it, where you can find magical potions. I love that magical potion table as well. I think it's, I've, I've actually oh, just taken it and I've printed it out. And it's just in my notes for for giving to you know characters in di in different games, just because yeah. they're all really exciting potions. That because there's so few sort of numbers in the game, you never have the crutch of uh, this one just gives plus one to a check, or you know this right. one makes your numbers better, or makes your mm -hmm. makes your sheet better, as you were saying earlier. Um, there's a lot of, but this has some interesting effect that you can use to solve a problem. This makes you very small. This uh, mm -hmm. makes you float around like Charlie Bucket in the um, in the uh, Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. Um, yeah. I think that that's a really nice uh, nice way of going about it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I try to create like um, if you're if you're given a special effect in a role playing game, I like it to be just you just have that effect. It doesn't make you like slightly better. Because when you start raising people's numbers, it feels very sterile. Um, 
they don't have a good, great sense of that. I don't feel that different. Your numbers are slightly better, maybe you roll a little bit better, but you don't feel different. But it was like, oh no, now you're one foot tall or like now you can shoot fireballs or now you can walk through walls. Like now I have an actual affordance that allows me to deal with the world differently. And so by combining those with the randomized scenes, you have this sort of endless combinations um, that are possible of ways to deal with scenes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, another one of the challenges that we uh, we gave you fairly early on was uh, there wasn't going to be any death and there was going to be mm. very little sort of violence um, in the game. So Sarah's not getting her head chopped off or anything in this <laughs> uh, in this game. Um, a lot of role playing games have a lot of um, sort of violence as conflict re resolution, and uh, we basically asked no on on that. Uh, it's a primary thing. There's definitely some action scenes in there. So was mm -hmm. that um, was that a difficult thing to do? It was a little bit of a challenge, but it was nice that there was a lot of other types of penalties that you can give, right? So you can take uh, characters' items away. You can give them sort of negative effects that they now have to deal with. But the biggest one is time, because you have to beat the labyrinth within 13 hours, just like in the movie. So um, whenever you fail at some sort of task, the penalty can always be that you lose an hour. Some of that stuff is built into this way the scenes are written, but of course the dungeon master or the goblin king um, can just create that as an appropriate penalty for doing something. You just lose an hour. So that creates this really interesting tension because time pressure is always a big thing in traditional old school dungeon crawls, right? You need to move through the dungeon quickly because there's like monsters chasing you, so time pressure is a thing. And then this is just time pressure in a different way. So it forces players to not just like hang out in a scene and just do stuff. They have to move forward. They have to make decisions and get forward as quickly as possible. Um, I really like that tension because it adds just uh, a lot more excitement to the scenes. Um, and it also adds almost an element of like speed running where <laughs> you have to like get through. I I'm really into speed running right now. I don't actually do any speed running, but I love, I love watching videos of how people do it. It's absolutely um, amazing what some people can make their yeah, fingers too. <laughs> that it's like it's a whole way of looking at games and so i love that idea that um getting through all the way through the labyrinth could be quite difficult but then the more you play it the more scenes that you see you have a better sense of what's in the labyrinth although it'll be very difficult to see everything um even after a bunch of playthroughs um, but you'll get better and better at it and hopefully you'll be able to push further through the labyrinth faster and faster um, and I can imagine different groups even like competing to see who can get through the labyrinth the fastest. And I'm imagining, a, idea. I'm imagining yeah. a sports hall just full of uh, full of tables of different people, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> different groups running through the labyrinth trying to complete it uh, quicker yeah. than anyone else <laughs> in exact in in thirteen hours in real world. Right. Yeah. But, um, which was quite um, funny, sort of looking at it. We've done some sort of calculations and play tests and things, and we we reckon it takes a few more than thirteen hours to uh, complete the labyrinth. <laughs> I guess it depends exactly on how much faffing about you do. We found our groups do a lot of faffing. <laughs> it would be interesting to actually have a challenge where, like, we're going to actually beat it in thirteen real world hours and see how quickly you can do it. Yeah, That'd I guess uh, a weekend, Saturday, Sunday, we're going to do it. Right. Yeah. And um, so. Who is your favorite character out of the labyrinth? Favorite character in the labyrinth? Hmm. Can be either one out of the movie or even one you've created as part of one of your scenes. I think I just, I love uh, Sir Didymus. Um, <laughs> it really spoke to me. <laughs> the, the little guy, the swashbuckler, um, who takes everything very, very seriously regarding his honor. I just, I found him an absolutely charming character. <laughs> Whilst riding a dog. <laughs> Whilst riding a dog. I, learned, I really like how, uh, so one of the things about, uh, so you can play different races, of course, um, and the uh, the knight race, the knights of yore, uh, their sort of special ability is the fact that they can find steeds within the labyrinth. Mm -hmm. So um, I really loved how you dotted around basically different creatures throughout the labyrinth that a player might bond with. And anyone who's played a role-playing game with a group of players knows that the first, like, cute animal that they meet, or even sometimes just the first animal, um, they are going to adopt. And so the yeah. fact that this is sort of in the in the game sort of as a as a thing that, you know, you go into the labyrinth as a Didymus and you find, you find your, your pet, your steed, 
and it can give you different abilities, of course. You know, some can climb up walls, some can run very fast to mm. get you out of danger if it's... Uh, what is it? What is Zambrogius? Is it... Uh, I don't know what breed he is. Yeah, a dog, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure somebody could tell us in the comments. Um, yeah, so uh, that's your favourite character. Um, we have one final question, very important. If you could give any live-action movie the Muppets treatment, that's where <laughs> all characters except the main character is turned into a Muppet, uh, a la Treasure Island or Muppets Christmas Carol, what movie would you choose? So I think my answer is going to be Dune, um, <laughs> because I, I'm really into Dune right now. I'm looking forward to the new movie. And I think that Muppets work really well when they're put in movies that are way more serious than they <laughs> yes, are. Yes, definitely. Right? Like that, that conflict yeah. is always great. Like, you know, like A Christmas Carol is a fairly somber type of, of movie. And it's great to have like Muppets just like wrecking everything around it. Fear. So I would just love Fear yeah. is the mind killer, the little <laughs> death. <laughs> I shall so put fear behind me and let it wash over thing. me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that'd be great. Just like having like the humans taking things very seriously, but all the, all the side characters are Muppets who are not taking it seriously. Oh man, who would play Baron Harker and. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the evil Muppet? Is there yeah. like a standard evil Muppet? No, the, the the villain in Muppet movies is always human. That's true. Almost always the, the so, villain is human. So Harko, that's oh, man. So probably like Paul and like and like Baron oh, Harkonnen. But Paul, Paul Atreides would probably be Kermit, right? He's usually the main. Yeah. Yeah, probably. But everyone <laughs> else, all the side characters are Muppets. <laughs> Now I'm going to try and cast Dune with Muppets in my head. Yeah, the, the Fremen would just... You'd have... Uh, you might have... You might have Gonzo as Paul Atreides and then just the Fremen as chickens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, well, thank you very much for um, giving us this interview. And um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. But, uh, and thank you even more so for writing... So many scenes for the labyrinth. I'm sure your fingers were very tired afterwards. <laughs> um, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you, and I hope that everyone watching has enjoyed this interview. And if you have any questions, feel free to throw them at us, either on Facebook, on Twitter, or below. I'm sure there's some comments, uh, as this is probably on YouTube. Hopefully on YouTube. Um, <laughs> and we will uh, try and answer those. But, um, and once again... If you want to see the other half of this interview, where I go ask some questions, as well as Chris, on uh, Questing Beast by uh, or by Ben Milton on Questing Beast, <laughs> and you can find us there. Thanks for watching our video. If you'd like to learn more, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can also like and subscribe to be told when we've released new videos. 